Chapter 8, Community Ecology, Structure, Species Interactions, Succession, and Sustainability. Also, Chapter 22, Sustaining Wild Species. When we look at the structure of a community, we are concerned about four things. Its physical appearance, or the size and shape of the community, the species diversity, or the number of species in the community, the species abundance, or the number of individuals of each species, and the niche and structure, or the number and variety of niches in the community. There are many different types of physical appearances for communities. They make the terrestrial or marine. Species diversity is determined by the latitude of the terrestrial community and depth of a marine community and the pollution in both. Islands are the exception to this. They are restricted both in size and by proximity to other organisms. If an island is very small, then we would expect to see fewer species types because there are few niches to fill. If an island is larger, then we would expect to see more species types as there are more niches to fill. In terms of proximity, if an island is close to other islands or the mainland, then we would expect to see higher species diversity because there is little hindering the immigration of species. If it is further, then we expect fewer species types. Overall, the proximity of an island determines immigration rates and both island size and available abiotic factors determine the success rate at which, as well as the death rate of these immigrants. In ecosystems, different species play different roles. If a species is known to be in a set location, then it is considered to be native to that area. If a species is not regularly seen in a set location, then it is considered non-native. Generally, non-native species end up in a location based off of a catastrophic event or by introduction. A species is considered an indicator species if they are sensitive to changes in their environment. A keystone species is a species whose role or niche is more important ecologically than the individual itself. If a keystone species is wiped out, then there is a high probability that the entire ecosystem will collapse. While studying the biogeochemical cycles in food webs, we discussed that species interact in their environment. The major types of species interactions include immensalism, commensalism, competition, both inter- and intraspecific, mutualism, parasitism, predation, and saprotropism. With immensalism, one species suffers while another is unharmed. Commensalism, one species benefits while another is unharmed. Competition, one wins out over another. Interspecific competition is between two or more species, and intraspecific competition is in, within one species. Mutualism, both species benefit. Parasitism, one species benefits at another's expense. Predation, one species benefits at another's expense, but must actively seek this advantage. And sapotropism, one species benefits off of the dead remains of another. Competition is bad at the individual species level. It can lead to endangerment and eventually extinction. By the competitive exclusion principle, we know that two species cannot fill the exact same niche at the exact same time. To get around this, we see what is known as resource partitioning. This is when organisms split a niche into multiple sections in order to avoid competition. This split can be physical, by time, or by means of resource acquisition. If species cannot avoid competition, then the species that is best fit for the environment in which it lives will be more successful and will eventually take over. If this happens at the community level, then we have what is called ecological succession. Ecological succession is the change in species diversity over time. There are two types. The first is primary succession. This occurs in locations where we have previously uninhabited land, such as hardened lava or exposed rock from aggressive um, erosion. The second type is secondary succession. This occurs when communities t overtake land on which species lived previously. Examples of this include growth of community on land that was previously devastated by a forest fire or a flood. The first species to establish itself in a new environment is called a pioneer species. Characteristics of species that we tend to see during the early stages of ecological succession are generally much smaller, grow quickly, and reproduce quickly. Mid-successional species include organisms such as shrubs and grasses. These organisms can only take over once the soil is fertile enough, by the way. Next, we have late successional species. These organisms generally have longer lifespans, are much larger, and reproduce at slower rates than early successional species. While still in the early successional stage, ecosystems are said to be immature. They are made up of small plants, the species diversity is low, and there are few, few very generalized niches. 
Once an ecosystem reaches the late successional stage, it is said to be a mature ecosystem. They are made up of larger species, the species diversity is high, and there are more specialized niches. Ecological succession occurs in unstable ecosystems. In order for an ecosystem to be considered stable, it must have the following characteristics. Inertia, constancy, and persistence. Inertia refers to an ecosystem's ability to resist change. Constancy refers to population sizes. If a population remains slightly below the carrying capacity determined by the abiotic factors provided in the environment, then it is said to be constant. And last, persistence is the ability of an ecosystem to bounce back from change. Why do we care about any of this? Well, humans are selfish. We are in it for ourselves. As a result, we see what is called the precautionary principle. This states that when the results of an action show evidence of being detrimental to humans, we try our best to counteract it as well as prevent it. Which brings us to chapter two. What are we doing about it? We negatively impact biodiversity by logging, mining, deforestation, overpopulation, pollution, and habitat destruction. As a result, many species are becoming threatened by our actions. A threatened species is a species that is running the risk of being endangered if we keep up our actions the way we currently are. Endangered species are organisms whose population numbers are so small that it may be difficult to come back without intervention. Extinct species are gone forever. This means that there is not a single living individual of the species left on the planet. There are three categories of extinction. Local, ecological, and biological. Local extinction refers to a small geographic location. If all of the squirrels in Oak Ridge disappear, then it would be considered a local extinction because there are still squirrels elsewhere. Ecological extinction refers to the niche a species plays. If an organism is said to be ecologically extinct, then its numbers are so low that it can no longer play its role in the ecosystem. If an organism is biologically extinct, then it is gone forever. There is not a single representative left. We know that we have an impact on population numbers because of direct things we do to a species habitat, such as deforestation or arson. <laughs> we can also impact the habitat indirectly by releasing invasive species into an ecosystem. An invasive species is a non-native species introduced into an environment in which it flourishes. The environment must have the abiotic factors the organism needs to survive. The biggest concern here is the lack of predation and competition. Without these two factors limiting population numbers, their populations can explode and grow exponentially. This can have a drastically negative impact on native species that are not used to having to compete for resources with such a large contender. What are we doing to help sustain wild species? We have three major laws in place to help. The first is the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, or CITES for short. It is an international agreement that international trade in wild animals and plants does not threaten their survival. It is a great idea, but it has weaknesses. It is hard to enforce, the fines are typically reduced after a conviction, and the countries that have signed the agreement can actually exempt themselves. Next, we have the Lacey Act. This provides or prohibits the transportation of live or dead wild animals or their parts across state borders in the United States. Again, it is hard to enforce, fines can be reduced, and it is hard to prove that someone is in violation of the act unless they are caught red-handed. Third, we have the Endangered Species Act. This is the strongest of the three. It provided a program for the conservation of threatened and endangered plants and animals and the habitats in which they live. The exceptions to this are if the organism is being used for scientific purposes or for the betterment of the species. Weaknesses include funding and the fact that it limits private landowners if an endangered species is found on their property. Overall, we have tried to preserve biodiversity, but we as, a as the entire globe, we don't seem to have the right solution yet.